In this lecture, we will discuss how to tap into people's thoughts, opinions, and feelings through surveys. We will cover how to construct and effectively administer a survey. Terminology can be a little confusing, as a survey is both an instrument for collecting data and a research method. As a method, survey research involves collecting data to find out what people think or feel about some topic or issue. Although survey-based studies do begin with research questions, these questions are often exploratory, with no formal hypotheses formulated about the results. Survey research can be quantitative, or closed-ended, in which the questions primarily generate answers from participants that can be counted and analyzed numerically, or qualitative, or open-ended, in which the questions generate answers that must be summarized in text form. Surveys often include both types of questions, as closed-ended questions can provide more precise information, while open-ended questions can provide richer details. There are two main types of survey research designs. The first, cross-sectional surveys, involve collecting data from a single group of people at a single point in time. This provides a snapshot of current beliefs and opinions, but is not meant to provide insight into any changes or trends over time. For example, a study that examines the confidence level of all pre-service teachers at a university in fall 2014 would provide a picture of that group's confidence level. However, it would not say anything about whether confidence changes over time or whether pre-service teachers at the same university have the same or different level of confidence in different years. The second type of survey, longitudinal surveys, involve data collection at two or more time points which is helpful for showing differences or change over time. There are two types of longitudinal studies. The first is a trend study, which studies changes over time in a particular population. For example, a study might examine the motivation levels of students at the same school in 2000, 2010, and 2020. Note that in this type of study, different groups of people are being studied at different times. The downside to this type of longitudinal study is that it doesn't show change over time per se. It just shows differences in groups at different time points. In the current example, if increases in motivation are seen between 2000 and 2010 groups, it is unclear whether students at this school are becoming more motivated, for example because of something the school is doing, or whether the different groups are being studied are inherently different in motivation. The second type of longitudinal study is a cohort study, which examines one group repeatedly over time. For example, a researcher might look at the language skills of a group of bilingual children when they are first graders in 2014, and then again in 2016, 2018, and 2020. Although such studies can show change in a group over time, the downside to these studies is attrition. People often drop out, which leaves the researcher unsure about whether the findings are truly representative of the population or only representative of the type of people who do not drop out. The first step in conducting survey research is to carefully construct a survey. Surveys, also known as questionnaires, should be as brief and focused as possible to avoid participant fatigue. Therefore, you should choose only those questions that will yield information to answer your research question nothing extraneous. As discussed earlier, closed-ended and open-ended questions provide different types of information. It is generally helpful to include both types of items in a survey. Closed-ended items have a finite number of response options. For example, Likert scale items require participants to indicate whether they strongly agree, agree, are neutral, disagree, or strongly disagree with a statement such as, I am satisfied with my graduate program. Another example of a closed-ended item is a rating scale item. For example, participants may be asked to rate the appropriateness of course objectives on a four-point scale, where one is very good, two is good, three is fair, and four is poor. In contrast, open-ended items produce qualitative rather than numeric data. For example, participants might be asked to provide suggestions for improving the ARD process at their child's school. When constructing a questionnaire, it is also helpful to focus each question on a single concept so that participants don't become confused or misinterpret the question. As a rule of thumb, it is helpful to collect some demographic information, such as gender, race or ethnicity, and other variables related to your population's key characteristics. 
This helps to better establish the degree to which your sample is representative of the population. If there are any terms that might be unfamiliar to participants, define these. And whenever possible, include a point of reference for com or comparison. For example, you might specify what very good, good, fair, and poor mean for specific items. Additional guidelines include avoiding leading questions, things that imply that there is a correct answer. Avoid overly sensitive questions about highly personal topics, as these can be a turnoff for participants. Don't base questions on false or questionable assumptions. For example, asking, how long have you been married, without giving an option for participants to indicate that they are not married, would be based on an assumption that all participants are married. Finally, organize items from general to specific to introduce the survey in broader terms before going into highly detailed questions. Once you have created items for your survey, it's helpful to have other people read your survey and give you feedback. Write detailed directions for participants so that your expectations are clear. Include a brief summary of the purpose of the study at the top of the survey, and then pilot test the survey with a group of people who are similar to your target population. In survey research, the higher the rate of return surveys, the better the study. This is because low response rates limit generalizability, that is, your ability to say that the responses you received are representative of the whole population's opinions or perspectives. Regardless of your initial rate of return, consider sending a reminder to all prospective participants after two to three weeks. In analyzing your data, you should always report the total number of people who responded to the survey and the total number of people to whom the survey was sent. You can also share the percentage of participants who answered a certain way. For example, you could report the percentage that answered yes and the percentage that answered no to the question, did you complete college? You could also report the percentage that answered strongly disagree, disagree, or neutral, and the percentage that answered agree or strongly disagree for the question, my campus administrators are supportive of teachers.